I have something here because I'm going to be talking to you about automating analysis with multi-model avocados. So I have some shirts here with some avocados on them. I might just throw them out to you guys, but you might have to pass them around because the sizes are kind of funky. So if you get like one and just pass it till someone can use it, I guess. I don't know. Here's a shirt. Woo! All right. Cool. Um, by the way, the multi-model avocados I'm talking about here is a RongoDB. It's a database, just in case. By the way, I can predict the future. There's my Twitter handle right there, Forensic Matt. Follow me because I have a feeling at the end of this presentation, you're going to say things like, oh, where can I find that tool? Where can I find this information you're talking about? Well, I'll tweet about it, throw up a blog post later, because none of that stuff is done yet. So, you know, just follow me on Twitter. So when I talk about automated systems, I don't want you guys to immediately think, oh, this guy's trying to push a find everything forensic button or anything. No, it's not really like that. Um, but when we talk about an automation system, what does that entail? So oftentimes when we do our investigations, I'm just gonna say, well, you know what, here, here's another shirt. All right, oh, that one has a fox on it, actually, because we, we'll get into that in a minute. All right, um, so when we go through our forensic investigations, this usually entails that we're looking for very specific things. We go, generally we're given a forensic image, right? Or we made the forensic image and we wanna pull some stuff out and look at it. So we do an extraction, we run a tool on, let's say we're looking for past executions. This could be prefetch, right? So we pull out prefetch, we run a tool on it, we get output. Um, but we need to know that something happened. So let's go ahead and extract out the registry. Let's look at the BAM keys, the DAM keys. Because um, we need to put more information together. So by the end of it, we've extracted out, I don't know, 20 different artifacts, ran 20 different tools, and now we have to do something with this output, right? So automation system, we want to use tools. We want to take that output, ingest it into a storage of some sort. Then when it's in the storage point, we wanna do some type of analysis so that in the end we get meaningful reports. And it would be great if we just didn't have to do a whole lot between then and the, the tool and the, or the image and the report so that we have more time to do meaningful stuff. So in looking at this, we, um, the better the tool, the better our output can be. And by having better output, it enables us to do better analysis, and better analysis leads to a better report. So, we have a tool problem, though. There's a challenge here, because when I look for a tool, I want all of the artifact, not just some of the artifact. But I'm scared that the tool thought I said give me a lot, of, or give me a lot of artifact. But what I want is the whole artifact. I want all of it. But the problem here is that there's output that's for humans, and then there's output that we need that's for analysis. And the two don't go together very well, right? So when you get output for humans, you're looking at TSV output, you're looking at comma-separated value output, right? Um, Excel, right? It's very linear, but the problem is when a tool starts trying to give us things that it thinks we would want to see, um, it, it can start skipping some data. Because in reality, the data structures behind these artifacts are very nested. They're not flat data structures. And so when you try and flatten it out, you get a lot of either duplicated data or there's some data that's just like, I don't know how to show this to you because it's too much for a human to look at. So we need that output for analysis. Why do we need this? So, oh, real quick, um, how do I go back? Yeah, so output for analysis might be way more complicated data because it's gonna be very nested data structures, right? So generally like JSON type data or XML. XML can be nested as well, but it's very difficult to go through that with the human eye. So we look at um, 
Why do we need this? Because there's so many artifacts. And when we take a step back, the more artifacts we can put together, the bigger picture we start to see. Um, so shell bags tells us something, MFTs tell us something, prefetch, USN, all of these things tell us one thing, but when we start looking at all of them together, it shows us a much larger picture. So this is why we need data for analysis, because when we have this nested data, generally we have things that we're missing in something like TSV form. Um, because you're just able to throw all of the data into it instead of just some of it. Uh, now we can link these artifacts together and start looking at a much larger picture altogether. But there's an analysis challenge here because if a tool only gave us output for analysis and not output for humans, um, it's very difficult to navigate that type of data. If you had a huge JSON dump, you know, how are you going to go through that? They make some JSON querying tools that can help, but it's, it's just, it's really hard to go through that type of data. Um, so we have issues of navigating it. We have issues of searching through it. Granted, you can always just, you know, grep through it. Why not? Uh, but then, what if we wanted to correlate it? What if we had JSON output from one tool and JSON output for another tool, and we want to combine it together and kind of make it relational type data? It's really hard, right? Not to mention the challenge of formatting the data, because in the end, we can't give a lawyer a whole bunch of JSON, right? That, that's just dumb. Um, but and then there's the challenge of automating all of it. So these are the challenges we face. So we need a solution that can address those challenges. I give you a RongoDB. Not only is its icon avocados, what's that? Somebody wants a shirt? All right. Oh, <laughs> this shirt didn't fly too well when it's unwrapped, my bad. But the purple ones are lady shirts, so that works out well. All right, so why ArongoDB? It's a multi-model database which consists of a document store, a graphing database, and a key value store all in one package, which is awesome. So we need a document store because of our data structure. It's all nested. But the problem with a lot of NoSQL solutions is that you can't relationally connect your data. Um, well, with Arongo, we can do this. We can, we can correlate v values from our highly nested data structures. It has a great query language. This is awesome. Uh, the relational queries. And great thing, it's not written in Java. Now, if I told you Java needs to die, everyone would be like, uh -huh. but if Jake Williams says it, maybe Java needs to die. I don't know. Anyways. But the great thing about this is it still maintains a scalable environment. So you can still spin up a bunch of servers and create your clusters just like you can with something like Elastic. Uh, and I'm sure some of you in here have experience with trying to put all of your data into Elastic. And then it's just hard to go through. Let's not even talk about Elastic. Yeah. Anyways, so another great thing about it is it ships with JavaScript microservices, which are fantastic because you can spin up your own um, interfaces if you wanted to write some, and when your server spins up, you can just access those. So and there's a great interface that ships with it, kind of like Kibana type thing. So what can we do with the RongoDB uh, that really helps us to see the larger picture and created a automated analysis workflow? Um, one of the things we can do is correlation, shirt time. I really hope I don't hit anyone's coffee and knock it over. That would be bad, actually. Maybe I should not do this. Um, Value-based correlations. So in a second, we'll see an example of it. But this is like MFTs. They have file reference numbers, right? How many other artifacts out there have file reference numbers? You can find file reference numbers in the USN journal, in the log file, in prefetch data, log fi uh, link files. They're all over the place. So now we can correlate and link these documents together, which is great. What about range-based? 
How, what if I wanted to say, oh, I want to see uh, 30 seconds of a given artifact after I see something else in another artifact? What if I see something bad in the prefetch and I want to look at historical records five seconds after that thing happened in the prefetch or after we know uh, executable ran, right? We can do that. We're, that's a correlation. Uh, you can create your own custom functions, which is awesome, because a lot of the time we process forensic artifacts and we still have values that are decoded, right? PowerShell, Base64, right? If we get PowerShell logs, we still have to decode with Base64. So we needed some way to do decoding on the fly so that we can do more analysis on the database side. Um, so then I'm going to talk about something a little bit more complex, which is pattern-based searching. And this is when you can actually group and aggregate artifacts and look for very specific patterns. And this is great. And this even goes back to what the FireEye guys uh, were talking about with uh, needing some type of resilient pattern, uh, resilient signature. We'll talk about this in a second. Here's an example, shell bag difficulties. You're looking through shell bags and you see two folders on the same volume. In this case, it's E. Did these two, are these two folders from the same volume? Now, sometimes we can figure this out really fast because maybe one's an NTFS volume and one's a FAT volume, and we know that FAT doesn't have the MFT sequence numbers, which we would see if it was NTFS. But it's not always that easy. But to, to answer a question like this, let's look at our underlying data. Shell bag data. You have MFT entries, this is important to us. You have sequence numbers, and then you have the name of the folder itself. What about linked data? All right, so you see here an example of nested data. A link, the link file structure is not flat by any means. It doesn't even resemble a TSV it's very nested. What are we interested in? We're interested in the file name. We're interested in any type, the volume serial number. We're interested in reference numbers, sequence numbers, entry numbers. So the cool thing about this is there's shell items per folder of, per folder and file of the local path. So you see test file 054 up there, you would have an entry for that, an entry for test folder 001. Uh, and what that means is you have parents, you have uh, entry numbers and sequence numbers for every single path in the link file. This is great because that means we can correlate link files and shell bags together because we want to know were they two separate volumes. So here's an example. You don't really need to know what it says, but the just is we're going to iterate through our link files and say, hey, let's compare anything where the file name the entry numbers and the sequence numbers are the same with those in the shell bags because in the end what we want is something like this where we can say, hey, no, we found a correlation and we can tell you that these two folders, while they're on the same E, they look, uh, they come from the E drive in the shell bags, they're not the same volume. That's important because now we know if we were looking at just the shell bags, we might say, hey, these things, it's the same volume. But no, it's two separate drives. Shell bag stores it on a drive letter basis. So tool shout outs. Guys, I'm not making this stuff up. I didn't just generate this data um, from somewhere random. No, I use real tools out there, right? So thanks, Eric. Thank you, GC. Thank you, Dave. Dave Cowan. He's generous. He throws out tools. It's cool. Um, what about a more complex question? Did a wiper run? Uh, what files were wiped? Where do we go to for this information? Uh, execution artifacts, right? We have file history artifacts. So two that come to mind, prefetch, we can find execution artifacts there. USN journal, historic file activity, great things. What's in our prefetch data? Prefetch data has run times. It has the file names in there. What about USN record data? That's going to give us, on a per change basis, one, the reason the file was, has a log in it, why it was ch changed, basically. Um, 
The timestamp of the change itself, file names, reference numbers, again, more correlation points for later. But what would a query look like where we could say, hey, did a wiper run? Were there files erased? What if we could automate this process and just have this query that goes through and it looks for some known examples? So we know if we, roll, uh, if we look through our prefetch and we see something called eraser, we know that's a wiper. Um, let's look for the file system activity 10 seconds after we knew, and we know between the time eraser ran and 10 seconds after it within the US SIN records to find out what, what was happening on the disk. When we run something like this, uh, this is the result. And so we see prefetch was ran. We find that from the runtime. And then we're looking from that point to 10 seconds after that point in the USN journal. And we see something real nice looking. These look like wiped files. We can see that because our first file, um, and in this example, it's in plain text, we see the data overwrite change. After that, we see that it goes through a iteration process of being renamed several times. Finally, the same file has the file delete operation done on it. And we know it's the same file because of the entry number. So there's a problem with this, though. Well, first, tool shout outs. All right, so a while back, I made some Rust tools. They're really cool. If you're into turning artifacts into JSON, these are great tools for it. Um, plus, it's cool that they're written in Rust, so they're super fast. And you can find them on the GitHub. Links up there. Um, so, real quick. So there's a problem with this, and the problem is we can't quantify this. We know we see five seconds worth of historical activity, and it does look like um, erasing. But we need to go further, and we'll get to that in a second. So let's talk about on-the-fly decoding real quick. This is important. Um, this is the cool, this is the Windows partition diagnostic event log. And this is something Jason Hale wrote a blog post on the other day. It was really cool. Because traditionally, volume serial numbers, which we were just looking at in uh, link files, um, were only really there if you had ready boost enabled. And now it's very rare that you have ready boost enabled by default. So it's hard to link things up with volume serial numbers to their correct device information. You could do, you could do time range correlations, right? We could say, OK, well, when was the last time that a device was plugged in and then go about it that way? But we don't need to. Now we could do some on-the-fly decoding and say, hey, let's look at these events, because these are new in the Windows 10. And there's a hex string of the entire VBR blocks, which is awesome. So it's within the VBR blocks that we can pull out the volume serial numbers. But we need to make a custom function to do that. So this is basically how you would do that. The Arongo DB ships with a shell, and you can register functions with it. That works out great for doing things like this. So I want to do a query, and I want to grab device information based off of this Windows event, and I want to be able to decode on the fly those volume serial, or the VBR blocks. So this is basically what that would look like. We call our, uh, we call our custom function, win event, and then what's the result? Something like this. So those VSNs are being pulled out on the fly from those raw hex dumps, which is huge. Because generally, your tool is going to give you some type of encoded data, and then you're going to have to further process that even more. So now we can do this all on the storage level. More tool shout outs, events to JSON was used for those examples. All right, so now we're going to talk about pattern searching. So pattern searching is cool because this is where uh, things can get dynamic. Because the problem is, 
um, you can't always rely on an MD5 hash. You can't always rely on the name of a file because those things change, right? So we want to create some type of query that's able to aggregate and group our artifacts, and we want to look for something very specific. Once again, you don't need to know what it says, you just need to know that this is how easy it is to do the groupings, do the aggregations. Why do we need to do this? Because let's go back to the white files. We can't quantify. If we tell a lawyer, hey, we know something's been wiped, what are they gonna ask? They wanna know what was wiped. How much of it? Was it important? We need to be able to give them those answers. So we want to automate this process, right? So what we can do is we, we now know that there's a pattern behind our wiping utility. And in this case, when we examine the data, we see that you have a minimum of eight file name being, uh, when a file gets erased, we have a minimum of eight renames. So you have the original name, that gets, has the data overwrite operation. Um, it has a minimum of three actions done to it before it gets renamed to six more, it gets renamed six more times. Each rename within the USN journal, uh, that file name, under that file name has five operations done to it, followed by a seventh sequential rename where it finally gets deleted. So this is actually a pattern that we can use in being able to quantify what all was erased. So um, we want to be able to create some type of signature that can look for this type of activity. And what's cool about this is you don't have to apply this to just file erasing. This is to forensics in general. Like we just, we want to look for pattern-based type of things. So now we throw our signature into our query and this is the result that we get. We found 138 files that matched that pattern that we can now say we know all of these files were erased because it matched our pattern. Here are the original names, here are the wiped names, and those are the times when that file was erased. It's pretty big. So. I wanna talk a little bit uh, about how we can automate this entire process and while it, why it's important, right? Because we're seeing a lot more that lawyers are coming to us and they're giving us more and more evidence, but they're wanting answers a lot faster than we can give it to them. Um, so a lot of this stuff can be automated, so it should be automated. But we shouldn't have to reinvent the whole wheel. There's a lot of tools out there that we want to utilize in this. So can we make a system that utilizes other people's tools, uses the output, puts it in a centralized storage place, allows us to do analytics on it, and then give us more meaningful reports? Because very few times do we, are we able to just run one tool, get one report out of it, and just hand that off. Usually. It's a combination of multiple tools, multiple output, having to put that output together, creating a report out of it, and then being able to hand that off. So here's an example, here's a demonstration that this can be done. So we've downloaded the ArongoDB package from ArongoDB site. It's a zip, which is awesome. What's cool about this is you don't have to install anything. You can just stand this up wherever, and it works on, their, they have the OSX version, they have one that runs on Linux and Windows. And again, you don't need the Java. Who cares? All right, so all you have to do, it's this easy. You just run, you start up your service, boom. It's up and running, right? So it gives you a socket, much like Kibana does, to where you can go there, you're gonna see an interface. So now we need to mount a drive. And then once we mount this drive, by the way, I love Arsenal. This is one of my favorite tools. It makes things very easy. All right, so we have our tools folder. Um, this is a tool that I worked on as proof of concept code. And what it does is it iterates through a volume, a live volume, and it extracts out files and then runs tools on those files. So in this case, we're looking at prefetch. It's basically looking for all the files with a PEF ending. It's gonna run 
the Rusty prefetch on it. Same with MFT. We've got some journal in there, um, and then the event logs as well. But this is great because we can just utilize other people's tools when we do this, and then do analysis with that, that output all in one central storage location. So we need to open up, uh, we're gonna open up PowerShell. We gotta start it in admin mode because you need that raw, um, that raw handle to a logical volume because we had mounted our image so that image is now mounted to uh, drive letter I, it's a logical image. Always give a dash H, tells you how to use the tool. So what we're gonna do is we give it the source volume. In this case, it's I. Then we need to tell it to give it a temp folder location because a lot of these files we have to export out before we can run something on it. Um, so then we give it the name of the database. So now it created a database in our Arongo cluster. It's going through, it's parsing out all the link files, registry, USN journal, MFT. We see how many records are being loaded in there. Some setup API, prefetch, right? Um, so now what we want to do is we can pull up, oh, I guess I got to let catch up. By the way, it doesn't go that fast. I wish it did, but I had to speed it up. Otherwise, we'd be sitting here for a while. Python's slow, but it allows us to do amazing things. Um, so then, oh, first we need to use our Arongo shell because we're going to create our user functions, um, which we had done earlier, and this is going to allow us to create reports using some of our more complex uh, custom functions. So now we're ready to go to our interface. Of course, there, are, by default, it's a root with no password, because why wouldn't you? So here's all of our collections. We had link files, USN, stuff like this. And this shows you, this is just what that data looks like within the database. Um, so here's the USN. U USN is relatively flat, but we nest out the reference numbers so we can do those correlations. Here's Windows event logs. Event logs are great examples of highly nested data. So let's run some queries. So some of this we already saw. This one is looking at PowerShell script blocks. So this is what we're looking in the Windows events. We see the PowerShell stuff. Uh, here's an example. I just wanted to show you all what the interface looks like because we're going to just cut over to the reports in a second. But this is, this is what the interface looks like for a Rongo DB. So it gives you just the interface that ships with it, gets you past those complex issues of uh, getting through the data with searching, navigating, the things I talked about earlier. So let's run some scripts we have. These are going to create um, template Excel files. So now we went from image to Excel reports, just like that. So there's one of the PowerShell blocks. You can see right there the um, DLL importing, things like the virtual alloc, uh, things that we would question. Here's a, a spreadsheet of our eraser and what files were erased after that. And then this one is the wipe files using our signature-based searching. So. That just gives you an example, yes, we can automate a lot of this stuff. That doesn't mean it's cutting anyone out of a job, it's going to allow us to get to more important analysis. It's going to enable us to look for more complex things and just get rid of the low, uh, the low hanging fruit. And one of the things I love about this conference is there's so much relevant data being taught in the presentations. I want a system like this that when I watch someone talk about a new artifact, I can plug it into this system using their new tool, and now every case that comes through our lab, we can be accounting for that information. Pretty big. I like it. I hope you liked it. Um, that's about all I've got for you. Right on. Well, thank you, guys. I have more T-shirts.